Uh, we, we don't know almost anything at all. It's amazing in the sort of pantheon of, of available knowledge that over the next uh, literally thousands of years, we're going to begin to develop in terms of medicine and the human body and physiology and, and healing. That body of knowledge, I think we have, I mean to say it's the tip of the iceberg that is available to us now is under is, is underestimating how much is beneath the surface right now. I think we know very little, and I think most physicians uh, are aware of how little we know, um, and yet they're sort of taught to act as though there's certainty in our field, and taught to act as though uh, not knowing is an indictment of medicine or an indictment of individuals. But the sort of tragedy right now of modern medicine as it relates to knowledge is the way we pose ourselves and the way we present ourselves to patients and to the society at large. And when we present ourselves as being all-knowing, they expect things from us that aren't possible. And it disappoints them. And it disappoints us. And it's mutually sort of destructive to, uh, to act as though there is knowledge that is not available or to act as though there is certainty when there is not. And embracing uncertainty is not something that we're taught to do, and it's not something that we have come to believe in, at least not naturally. And I think we need to embrace uncertainty a little more in order to be good at what we do as physicians. Um, so an example of it doesn't work from that chapter is uh, ACLS. Uh, and ACLS is Advanced Cardiac Life Support. It's, a, it's an algorithm for care for patients who are in cardiac arrest. Uh, it's an algorithm that we've been using in medicine for the past maybe 30 years or so. Uh, and it was an algorithm that was developed uh, in order to standardize and improve the treatment of cardiac arrest care. And what we've discovered uh, over the last probably 10 years or so of, of higher level research on advanced cardiac life support treatments is that they just simply don't work. They don't save lives. Uh, there is no evidence at all that the algorithms that we use that are advanced cardiac life support algorithms um, which are lists of medications to administer and lists of procedures to perform. There's excellent evidence at this point that they don't save lives at all. And we continue to do it. We continue to perform advanced cardiac life support procedures uh, and administer the medicines and follow the algorithms, even though we've proven beyond all shadow of a doubt that they don't save lives. Um, so the question is, why do we do that? And, and what that chapter is trying to get at is uh, that there is a whole, there's a whole set of um, ACLSs out there that we are um, practicing in medicine. And, and we continue to sort of, um, we continue to harm ourselves and our standing and our stature and our patients when we continue to embrace uh, sets of care and algorithms of care like ACLS when they've been totally disproved. Um, so it doesn't work as a way of trying to jar us into realizing um, that a lot of the things we do every day we know don't work and we continue to do them anyway. Evidence-based medicine and the pursuit of evidence-based medicine, while it's been irritating at times and it's sort of been a, a thorn in some people's sides and it has not on occasion led to, uh, led to pathways that, that we don't actually want or embrace, evidence-based medicine is the attempt to embrace critical appraisal and the understanding of research in ways that are valid and that translate into real practice. So there are real problems in biomedical research and, and there, are, there are cults of personality. There's no, there's no doubt about it. And there are, there are real misunderstandings when personality and bias get in the way of actual fact and science. But if you look closely at research, you can almost always cull important facts from research and you can always come to some sort of a conclusion that helps you and forwards your knowledge. And critical appraisal is all about trying to set aside those problems, which, while it's not always possible, it generally is, and we've been terrible, terrible, in the last 20 or 30 years at embracing evidence-based medicine and turning it into real practice. And the book is partly about that. The book is partly about really understanding evidence um, and taking away the biases that we bring to the table. We bring uh, a love of the idea of myocardial demand. We love to hear about how reducing myocardial demand in heart attacks saves lives. And yet, if you look closely at the research, it doesn't save lives. It doesn't save lives 
to give a beta blocker or to give a calcium channel blocker. Those are not life-saving measures when you use them right at the beginning of a heart attack the way they're supposed to be life-saving. So we have loved the ideas and yet we've ignored the research. So part of the problems with research, uh, and I think the, the biggest problem with research is that we have been derelict in understanding it appropriately and pulling out the facts where they lie and not allowing our love of theories and our love of ideas and our personalities and our biases to get in the way. We tend to like to talk in, um, in relatives. We say, for instance, uh, you take an aspirin during a heart attack, it's going to reduce your chances of dying by about 20%. That is true, but it's not true. What is true about that is that when you say it's reducing your chances of dying by 20%, the only people you're looking at in that calculation are people who die. And you say, oh, 20% fewer people die. But you look at people who have a heart attack, 90, 95% of them don't die. So it leaves 90 or 95% of the people out of that calculation. And the 90 or 95% of people all got aspirin too in those studies. So when you say it reduces your chance of dying by 20%, you've left out 90 or 95% of the study population. That's a very unfair way of presenting the data from a study because before you ever got into the study, before you ever administered an aspirin, you don't know whether you're going to be the one who dies or lives. So your expectation about what's going to happen to you should be based on all of the possibilities, whether aspirin's going to affect you or not. You want to know if it's going to affect you and what the chances are. You don't just want to know if you're among the dead people, how likely are you to benefit from the aspirin? It's not about that. The NNT includes all of the information that patients should have about a medicine or about an intervention. Um, it is based on uh, a number, a statistic, that is uh, embedded with all of the information from all of the patients in a single study. When you talk about the NNT, you're actually giving patients uh, a sense of what the chances are that they're going to be affected by a certain medicine or a certain intervention in a given way. NNT is a way of delivering information that is incredibly valuable. It's embedded with all kinds of information, and it's really honest. It's much, much more honest than saying 20%, uh, which gives you the impression that there's a 1 in 5 chance it's going to save your life. There's not. There's about a 1 in 40 chance that aspirin's going to save your life during a heart attack. Um, and understanding that it's a 1 in 40 chance allows you to really put that in perspective. It doesn't mean you shouldn't take an aspirin. Geez, if if I was having a heart attack, I want an aspirin. You know, a, a 1 in 40 chance it's going to save my life. That makes all the sense in the world to me. It doesn't mean you don't take the aspirin. What it means is you understand how important that is compared to everything else. And you understand what is affecting your health the most and what is affecting your health less. And that's really, really important for patients to actually have access to that information. We've neglected that, and the NNT is a way of communicating that. I do believe that NNT is a part of a comprehensive consent process, in a way. Um, and the consent process, you know, it almost, it almost sounds um, inflated to talk about it as a consent process to me, because what I really mean by that is transparency. You know, all of this should be transparent. Patients should have access to these decisions if they want them. Sometimes patients don't want them. Sometimes patients will, you know, um, They'll ask you to simply be their advocate, to simply uh, be their proxy, to make all decisions for them. In most cases, though, patients really want to be involved, and transparency is the only way to get them involved. So transparency and consent, the NNT is all about that. The NNT is all about delivering information so that they can make a transparent, consensual decision about not only their treatment, but their next choices over the coming days after their heart attack, for instance. It's, I mean, it's critical. It's what you would want. It's what I would want. It's what patients should have. It's what they have a right to. It's what the patient's bill of rights tells them they have. And it's something that we all ought to endorse because it's something we believe in for ourselves and for them.